Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. You know, I love RVs as evidenced by my videos such as Don't Buy an RV or the latest RV ripoff or the other topics I've talked about involving RVs and how I actually don't think you should buy one lightly. Now, if you want to buy one and you want to do the research into it and study it and, and really get to know what you're doing, you can actually get an RV, okay? But you have to know what you're doing. And, and it's kind of funny because a lot of people understand that, you know, I couldn't put this huge description in a title to a video. You know, if you really want to buy one, do the research. So, you know, I said don't buy an RV. But, but I was basically saying don't buy an RV until you've done the research or you really know what you're getting into. Because without question, the most common phone call, email, comment, or feedback I get on all of my videos, on all of my channel, the most common thing I get is from people saying, Steve, I bought an RV and I'm ticked off. So here's the deal. If you're going to buy an RV, there's a lot of stuff you got to study. And I've covered a lot of that in my other videos. I'll put the links in the description. And primarily, you have to understand what you're buying is not a big car. And it's also you're not buying a house on wheels. Unless you think about it being a really, really poorly built house on wheels. And, and most people don't like to think that. So most people go, well, you know, I, I, I drop 50 grand buying a car. I drop 100 on an RV. Boom, things are good. Until they realize that the car has certain legal protections in all 50 states. And the RV might not have legal protections like that except in one or two states. It depends what state you're in. And I'm not going to get into the state by state thing. That's research you got to do on your own. But understand that distinction exists. But also understand that the RV selling industry is different. People who sell RVs for a living actually have a slightly different art form than the people who sell cars. So you got to understand that as all as well. So I've, I've talked about different things they may do to you when you're trying to buy the buy the RV. And so one of the more interesting things that's popped up recently, and I'll admit I saw this article written by my good friend Jason Torchinsky over at Jalopnik. They call him the Torch. And uh, he writes a lot of really good stuff about cars. I've met him. I've met him. I met him the same night I met the other people from Jalopnik who came into town to do the kart racing the weekend of the North American International Auto Show's launch. They're from the media. They come in early, that kind of thing. And um, so he wrote an article, and, and I went and looked at the video he's talking about. And here's the thing. Sweden, Sweden of all countries, has decided to do some testing on RVs to see how crash-worthy they are. And I'm sure you know if you watch news that you've seen that they take cars built in America and they crash them on purpose in a laboratory setting and they film it with the crash test dummies in the car, not the band, the actual things, and they, and, they, and they ram the cars into a brick wall, they run them into an obstruction at an angle, occasionally they run them into each other, and they study how these cars withstand impacts and accidents or collisions or crashes, whatever you want to call them because this is all being done intentionally. So they're doing this to see how well they withstand crashes. And of course, for some odd reason, they don't crash test RVs like that in North America. And I suspect they've been exempted out, meaning that somehow the RV industry found a kind ear in Washington who said, oh, we don't have to test you guys. What's an RV? It's not an automobile. It's not covered by the Lemon Law. Why would it need to withstand a crash of any sort? So there's a, a, a gap in this knowledge in America, but that gap is being filled by some experts in Sweden. And uh, this is uh, because in Sweden, the number of newly registered motorhomes has been on the increase. And in fact, it's jumped by 50% in the last five years. So according to the Swedish Transport Administration, or as they say in Sweden, this is from the traffic Verkat. The Swedes have got such an interesting looking language. It's not as mechanical sounding as Finnish, but um, with the surge of new wheels on the road, RV wheels, uh, there have been more injuries and deaths. This prompted Traffic Verket, or the Swedish Transport Administration, to study the safety standards of motorhomes and execute its own crash tests with two different European market RVs. Now, that's one of the problems, is that, you know, if you want to look at American car makers, I mean, you go, there's a whole bunch of them, right? There's a boatload 
of RV manufacturers, and they make a bunch of different models and a bunch of different sizes, and you can buy, and I, I use the term interchangeably when I say RV. I could be talking about a little thing, medium-sized thing, or a big thing. And by a big thing, I'm talking about the big old ones that actually have, you know, like a diesel pusher, and it's on the frame of, of, of like a, you know, a bus or something. Uh, and, and then you can get all the way down smaller, and some, of course, these have slide-outs that can make them even bigger. It's, it's like an animal in the well that can make itself look bigger. Uh, some RVs can do that when you park them. You park the RV, you start doing the slide-outs, the next thing you know, this thing's twice as big as it was going down the road. But the question, of course, is what happens when that thing crashes? And so with so many different manufacturers and makes and models and configurations, it would probably cost somebody a fortune to crash test a whole bunch of those. And as you know, our government is so good at spending our money that they probably found more important things to spend our money on. So it's good that they're not wasting their money doing RV testing like this. But one of the things that inspired the Traffic Verket report was that at least six people in Sweden have died in RVs or campers since 2014. So you might say, well, wait, six people have died in five years? Well, that's a huge jump because the numbers of RVs and roads weren't that big before. And also, here's the thing. More than 100 have been injured in motorhome-related traffic accidents in the same time period. The most common type of crash was a front-end collision, which is the main focus of these crash tests. And by the way, I will also put a link directly to the video showing you the crash test in the description below. Now, one of the articles I printed off here says, the results and accompanying videos are pretty terrifying. Well, I wouldn't call them terrifying. They're, they're, they're scary if you think, hey, that could be me <laughs> in the seat there. But of course, um, you know, it uh, depends on your viewpoint. But for the tests, Traffic Verket used the same methods the European New Car Assessment Program, or Euro NCAP, uses. That test has a motorhome drive into a similarly weighted barrier at 64 kilometers per hour, or about 40 miles per hour. And the test did not list exactly which models were used, one of which had a semi-integrated cabin, while the other had a fully integrated cabin. And again, this, like I said, is one of the problems. There'd be a logistics problem just setting up these tests if you actually had to crash test each one of these because there's so many different variations on it. Um, both are built on a platform that Traffic Verket says underpins 84% of that market's motorhomes. Thus, the tests are largely representative of most motorhomes on the road in Sweden. I just realized Sweden's that way. What was I thinking? The first crash uh, in the video you're going to see that if you watch below occurs about two minutes in, and the nose of the semi-integrated motorhome is demolished, as you might expect. And the second crash is about a minute later, but it's even worse. Uh, there, nearly the entire body of the RV separates from the platform, revealing lots of the wood construction and virtually no energy-absorbing structures. So I'm going to show you uh, the link to that video below. But, you know, here's the thing. For some odd reason, people in America are conditioned to think, if I spend $5 on something and I get something, if I spend $10, I should get twice as much. So if I get twice the volume, that makes sense. I buy $5 worth of liquid of some sort, $10 should get me twice as much, right? And if I buy something that's average value, just average value, it costs me five bucks, the $10 one should be a higher value. It should be, it should be a higher quality, right? In other words, let's, let's suppose I'm selling widgets, right? And I just have three widgets and you go, what's the difference? I go, what's well, grade A, grade B, and grade C? You go, how much for the grade C? I go, five bucks. How much for the grade B? 10 bucks. How much for the grade A? 20 bucks. You say, what's the difference? Like, nothing. It's prices. <laughs> you go, that's stupid. People expect that these different grades are going to be different quality. And so when somebody goes and they're shopping for RVs, and they're looking at the motorhomes, and they're going, well, it's, this one here is $75,000 brand new. And you start looking at it, and if you actually start studying the construction of it, you actually open the doors up and look at how the cabinets are attached. Open the drawers up and see how well they slide. You know, actually look at the materials. You're going to go, wait a second, this thing doesn't seem to be built that well. Especially if you're used to living in a home, an actual house. <laughs> if you're living in a van down by the river, it might seem like a step up. But if you're, if you're living in something that's considered to be a house or a home by most people, you're going to be surprised at the build quality of a motorhome or RV that costs less than $100,000. You're going to be shocked. 
okay? And I'm telling you right now, I have people call me, they, 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 they literally are driving the thing off the lot when the stuff starts falling off the walls. And I'm not talking about knickknacks, I'm talking about shelving units or cupboards falling off the walls. So this stuff can happen. So you go, okay, so if the sub $100,000 home, RV, whatever it is, if that's lousy quality, if I buy one for $150,000, that's going to be better quality, right? Not necessarily. Sometimes what you're paying is you're just getting a longer unit or your unit's got more stuff in it, but the stuff is just as poorly built as the one that's cost less than $100,000. you got to do the exact same thing. you got to get in there, like open up all the drawers, check the hot water. I've had people tell me they actually got in an RV that's allegedly ready to go and the water wasn't even hooked up. Nothing came out of the faucets. Nothing. It wasn't, it wasn't that warm water came out of the hot water. No, nothing came out. They flush the toilet, nothing happens. I'm not making this stuff up. This stuff happens. So I've had people say, oh, I bought a brand new unit. It had a checklist on it. And it said that this guy walked through this checklist. They charged me $1,000 for the inspection. By the way, that's the other scheme I talk about. And they go, how'd you miss the fact that the water doesn't work? The guy's, oh, that's the one thing I didn't look at. Yeah, that's right. Um, so... The idea that if you spend more money on an RV automatically means you're getting a better RV is simply not true. And so if you're getting the $200,000 RV and it's on the chassis with a diesel pusher and it's, it's all these names you recognize, big names, and you go, wow, I've heard of that company that made this engine, made this drivetrain, made this chassis. Those things are built to last. Yeah, the chassis is. You're not going to live in the chassis. You're going to live in the box that was put on top of the chassis that was built the exact same way that the lesser ones are built also. I'm speaking in generalities. I understand there are some motorhomes out there where they'll actually do that and they'll put like a $400,000 build on top of this thing. It's a half a million dollar RV by the time they're done. And that, yes, that's a higher quality vehicle. But my point simply is that you should never assume that because you paid more for something, that it's automatically higher quality than the lesser expensive thing, especially in this field where people don't know what they're looking at. So when you're going to go in and look at an RV, regardless of the price, you need to actually look at the build quality and actually ask yourself, how is this piece of wood joined to this piece of wood? Is it a nail? Is it a screw? Is it one of those weird things that is just a piece of dowel that gets stuck in there and another piece of dowel sticks on top of it and you hope it holds it together? Is it assembled like an Ikea bookshelf? How, how are these things put together? But the other thing I want to talk about, and getting back to the crash tests in Sweden, it's like the price of tea in China. Crash tests in Sweden, but they do affect us. Is that if you're rolling down the road in an RV, you're on the highway of America, you're seeing this land, it's our land, it's your land, it's my land, you're seeing the land, you're driving down the road, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking it's kind of like I'm on an airplane. Someone up front is driving, and I can just wander around the back, and, and a stewardess might, or steward might tell me to sit down, put on my seatbelt once in a while, but I can get up and stretch my legs, walk around. Oh, by the way, there's a big old TV back there. Hey, let's go back there and watch TV. Fire up the microwave, make some popcorn. Next thing you know, there's a party going on in the back of this RV, going down the highway, right? Except the pro problem, of course, is, as we just discussed, what happens when an RV hits something, and it happens. Now, I'm not saying all these RVs will be in accidents. I'm not saying all the RVs will run into something 40 miles an hour. But that's where you realize one of the dangers that most people don't think about is that if you're in the RV and you hit something at 40 miles an hour and the RV comes to a sudden stop, the insides don't, okay? So all of the stuff that's in the RV, imagine this is an RV, is just going to come flying forward to hit people. Uh, drawers can come flying apart. Anything back there that's not nailed down or bolted down or screwed down comes flying out. Stuff can come flying off the walls. Remember those shelves I told you about that just fall off the walls and you hit a, hit a bump? What do you think they do at 40 miles an hour when you come to a sudden stop? They're going to come flying off too. And if you don't believe me, just check the traffic verket video from Sweden and watch what happens at 40 miles an hour. Now, I understand you're saying, Steve, I've been driving a motorhome for hundreds of thousands of miles. I've never been in an accident. And you walk around the RV park, you walk around the state park, you walk around the... And you'll see all these beautiful RVs. They're not all smashed in and caved in. They're not in accidents. In fact, many of them 
are not actually on the road as much as they're parked. Okay? So you put it in a park here for a month, you get bored, you undo everything, put it together, and you cruise up the road to another state maybe, put down roots there for a little while, right? And so you're, it's true. It, it'll spend 29 days a month parked and two days a month moving maybe. Okay, I'm, I'm just making up numbers here. So the odds of that RV getting in an accident are astronomically slim because it's only being driven two days a month, right? Well, again, false sense of security because if it happens, no one plans on being in an accident or a crash, depending on what you want to call it. Uh, but if it does happen, you're going to want to look around beforehand and make sure that there's nothing loose back there that's going to come flying off and turn into a projectile and come sailing down the aisle to whack somebody. And uh, as you may guess, there are seat belts and airbags in the front two seats on many of these vehicles. There might not be anything safety-wise from that point backwards. Many states don't even address that. Some states do. But the point simply is this. If you're driving down the road in your RV... Don't just go, hey, look, dad's up front driving. He's the pilot. We can just run around back here like we're crazy people on a, on a, on a, on a cheapo flight to Fort Lauderdale for spring break. And um, you should also be aware of the fact that just because you bought the RV and you threw six figures, a big pile of cash at it, doesn't mean it was assembled and is any higher quality of a build than the cheaper one. It might just be a bigger one, but just built the same as cheaply. So again, those are some more things to think about. But really the news here is these things don't do well in crashes. You should be aware of that. Now that you're aware of it, live your life accordingly. If you choose to ignore it, that's fine. But you have been warned. RVs don't do well in crashes. Questions or comments, put them below. Otherwise, talk to you later. Bye-bye.